السلام عليك يا أمين الله السلام عليك يا أمير المؤمنين. Now sometimes when we're having discussions or debates with other Muslims, they say you exaggerate the day of Ghadir. It's an event, that, why should you celebrate it? It's the Prophet announcing something. It's something that happened in the past. What does it really matter today? Why is it so important to uh, so many Muslims, uh, especially the Shia Muslims and the followers of Ahl al-Bayt, and why they consider it to be one of the greatest Eids and they celebrate and so on and so forth. And the reason behind, of course, is the, uh, the deep, profound theological aspects associated with this day that are related to the lives of uh, believers that need to be understood. It is not merely a historical occasion, but an event that has implications upon our lives and our aqidah, our doctrines and teachings. Very briefly, a number of crucial points that need to be understood on this. The first is, that the Qur'an says all the prophets came with one religion inna deena inda Allah al-Islam that uh, religion with Allah is one and that is Islam and this message or this teaching set of collection of teachings were passed where you know one prophet after the other they came to establish and affirm believe in Allah and follow the prophets do righteous deeds and you'll be held accountable on the day of judgment this is how the gist of this particular religion is. Now, all the 124,000 prophets, they came one after the other, and some of them were at the same time as the other. They were working under or within this particular religion. The day of Khadir is the day that all these prophets saw the completion of this one religion. So it's not about only Islam as we know it with the Holy Prophet and so on. It's about history of mankind from day one, from Adam. All those prophets that came would be celebrating the day of Ghadir because the day of Ghadir is the day where all their efforts has been put in terms of the fruition and the completion. Yes, and the Prophet of Islam is the, of course, the final and the greatest of the Prophets. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says through the wilaya of Imam Ali alayhi salam, that is where the work of all these Prophets have now been complete. That's the first. The second is, we have to understand the Quranic uh, terms, uh, ikmal and itmam. Akmaltu lakum deenakum, atmamtu alaykum ni'mati. What does it actually mean in our understanding based on the theological concepts that we have. And it's important to give an example so that this is understood. In the month of Ramadan, if an individual fasts for the whole day except the last 10 days, sorry, if they fast the whole day except the last 10 minutes before the sunset, there is nobody out there from the scholars or the Muslims, different schools of thought, who actually believes that their fast is valid. Because despite the fact that they've observed the fast for the last majority of the day, they have not completed the fast. They have missed it by 10 minutes. You can't say, well, they'll get 90% of the reward or 95% of the reward. It's unlikely. Of course, Allah knows best, but as far as we understand, you need to observe the fast. Similarly, if in Salatul Dhuhr or Asr, we perform instead of four rakats, three rakats, intentionally. I say, well, you know, 75%, I should be okay. No, it's either the four, yes, or nothing is accepted, yes. Similarly, we are told the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم This ikmal means you have to complete and through wilaya of Imam Ali alayhi salam the religion is complete. Without the wilaya the religion is incomplete which means this that deeds and actions must be encapsulated by this wilaya. Otherwise in our understanding these deeds will not necessarily achieve their objective they will be fruitless. 
they will not be uh, um, accepted. They must come with the idea of the wilaya. The wilaya must be there. And therefore, an example of this is what happened on the 10th of Muharram. On the plains of Karbala, there were two sides, one which were about 100 people, and the other around 30,000. They're both Muslims. Even today, we have examples of criminals or terrorists such as Daesh, ISIS, and others, Al-Qaeda, and so on. They consider themselves Muslims. They pray, they you know, fast, and so on. They recite the Quran. It's not about the practice of religion. It's about who you consider to be your authority after the Holy Prophet. And that's why on the 10th of Muharram you had the righteous side, which was characterized by Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, who he was the wali. And you had the other side, Omar ibn Sa'ad, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, and Yazid. That he was the wali. So he was the authority. He was telling them what to do. And they listened to them and they did not obey Imam Hussein. So we cannot say both of them are in Jannah because they both practiced religion. One has to be the right and the other has to be the false. And the barometer here is wilaya. Similarly, here in this particular verse and in the whole incident of Ghadir, what it's trying to say is that it is of the utmost importance to understand the delicate and sensitive issue and the prerequisite of the uh, correct authority after the Holy Prophet in order for the uh, actions and the deeds to be actually presented in the way that will inshallah be accepted. Now we fast forward two months later after Ghadir, the Holy Prophet Islam is on his deathbed he is severely unwell. Some narratives mention that he's been uh, given some substance or uh, medicine, so-called, that is actually uh, hastening the end of his life. And his state is such that he gains consciousness, then he regains consciousness, and then he goes back into unconsciousness in these final moments. He orders, there's an, there's an imminent attack from the Romans, so he orders that he wants uh, the army to go and uh, repel this attack from them entering into Medina. The army is headed by Osama bin Zaid bin Haritha, who's 19 years old at the time. People object to him being very young. The Holy Prophet says, I have chosen him and this making Osama the head of the army was also a very important message from the Holy Prophet of Islam that even as he's going, he's, making, he's, telling, uh, he's telling us that even the head of the army, the head of the uh, delegation that's going to fight a group of people is not your choice who will lead it. That choice is also Allah and his messengers. So when <clears throat> somebody who's a leader for a short period of time cannot be chosen by the people. How can someone who's going to be the leader after the Holy Prophet in its entirety in the, for the religion of Islam, how can that person be chosen by anybody other than Allah and the Prophet? How can anybody, uh, how can that leader who, which is going to be forever for after the Holy Prophet Islam has passed away, how can that person be chosen by anybody other than Allah and the Prophet? In any case, the people disobey him, they don't join the army of Osama, he has to come out in this state of uh, being unwell. He's supported by Imam Amirul Mu'minin on one side and Abbas, the uncle, on the other side. And he comes into the masjid and he goes on the minbar and he says that I want everybody who I've ordered to go and join the army of Osama. And whoever doesn't join, join Jaysh Osama, whoever doesn't join the army of Osama, Allah and his messenger do la'anat on that person. In any case, Holy Prophet Islam now passes away. When he passes away, he's in the chamber um, and uh, preparations for his passing away are going to, are about to take place. A group of people, a group from the Mahajireen who have planned and plotted that since the announcement of Ghadir that we will not allow Imam Amirul Mu'min to be the successor. The reason 
we know that he will act in the way that Rasulullah, in the way that the Messenger of Allah wanted to act. He will not favor us over other people. He will act justly. He will act with justice, with fairness, with uh, religious principles. He will not act in a way that will uh, favor one group of people over another group of people. So therefore we will not get any favors from him. This group of people have made this plan. On the other side we have the Ansar. The Ansar who are the people from Medina. The ones who hosted the refugees from Medina, from Mecca to Medina. These, this group of people have decided and they've learnt and they know that Mahajirin are jealous of Imam Amirul Mu'min They don't want him to become the successor. They will not allow him to be the successor even though the Prophet has made this announcement. And we would not accept anybody from the Mahajirin other than Imam Amirul Mu'min Why? Because they know that Imam Amirul Mu'min has been appointed by the Holy Prophet of Islam. So at the same time, Ansar have gathered at this place outside of Medina, it's called Saqifah Bani Sa'ida, and they're having a meeting there to discuss this dilemma, that Mahajirin will not let Ali be the successor, we will not accept anybody other than Ali, so therefore before they propose somebody as their successor, let's bring our own person as our successor. Sa'ad bin Ubada is the head of one of the Ansari tribes, and he's very old. It's mentioned that he is also very old and frail and very ill at this time. And he's been brought out from his bed to chair the meeting. This discussion is going on and almost unanimously Ansar have agreed on Saad bin Ubadah as the successor. They've made sure that Saad bin Ubadah will be the successor after the Holy Prophet of Islam because we don't want anyone from Mahajirin to be the successor. At that moment in time, there's three individuals who, the first Khalifa, the second Khalifa and Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah who learn that there's a meeting about uh, Khilafat happening at Saqifah Bani Sa'idah. First Khalifa is in the chamber with the Holy Prophet Islam, second Khalifa is outside. Second Khalifa sends a message to first Khalifa that people have gathered at Saqifah Bani Sa'idah and they are planning to appoint Sa'ad bin Ubadah as the successor. First Khalifa, second Khalifa and Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah, all three of them accompanied, uh, all these three go towards Saqifah bin Sa'idah. When they arrive at Saqifah bin Sa'idah, there's a, uh, almost an agreement to make Sa'ad bin Ubadah as the successor. When he goes there, the Second Khalifa stands up and he mentions the reasoning why the Ansar cannot be the Khalifas. And he says that the Mahajirin are the ones who are the closest to the Holy Prophet. They were with him in the beginning. They supported him in all these difficult times and they came to Medina and he continues to support him, so on and so forth. And the Muslims will not accept anybody who is not from the tribe of the Holy Prophet, from the Quraysh. Eventually, there's now a, a shift and a change in the tide. Why? Because there was two tribes who existed in Medina prior to Islam, the Aws and the Khazraj. And uh, they would fight with one another, with one another. they would uh, quarrel with one another. The Holy Prophet Islam, when he came to Medina, he put an end to this fighting and he considered and said that you, all of you are brothers. Now this enmity it came out into the open again. Because Sa'ad bin Ubadah was the lead of the Khazraj tribe, Bashir ibn Sa'ad, who was from Aus, he came forward and pledged allegiance to first Khalif. When he pledged allegiance, a few other people pledged allegiance as well. And then the tide had now shifted. Why second Khalifa stood up and said, I want you to, he, he, you know, this is the authority of Quraysh. First Khalifa had stood up and then he holds on to the hand of the second Khalifa and Abu Bad ibn Jarrah and he says these are the two people that I think one of these two would be good as Khalifa so choose one of them. Instead of or before anybody would reply to that the second Khalifa himself stands up and he holds on to the hand of the first Khalifa and pledges allegiance to him and says that I've pledged allegiance to you because there's nobody uh, more superior and better 
than you out of all of us. When he does this, now there's a dispute and a disagreement between the Ansar. So, as we said, the Ansar were in the Aus and Khazraj tribes. They had old enmity, but the Holy Prophet had removed this enmity. Now, because Sa'ad bin Ubadah was the leader of the Khazraj tribe, Bashir ibn Sa'ad, who is from the Aus tribe, he takes this opportunity to pledge allegiance to the first Khalifa. When he pledges allegiance to the first Khalifa, now there's a divide between the Ansar. Some people are arguing that no, Sa'ad bin Ubadah should be the Khalifa. Other people are arguing no, it should be this person. Why? Because he's not from our tribe. After all this commotion, first Khalifa becomes or is announced or proclaimed as the Khalifa. Now they return. This is Monday, 28th of Safar, the day the Holy Prophet of Islam passed away. After they return back from Saqifah, it's very late at night. The next day, Tuesday, 29th of Safar, is the announcement to the leaders of all the tribes that after the Prophet, Abu Bakr has become the first Khalifa. You all are invited to come and pledge allegiance to him. All the leaders of the tribes, they all come and pledge allegiance. So out of the people uh, on, on the second day when they're invited to pledge allegiance to the, the, the first Khalifa towards Abu Bakr, is not just an ordinary way of demanding allegiance, but rather second Khalifa has gone round and said, if you don't pledge allegiance, you will be killed. If you don't pledge allegiance to the Abu Bakr, you will be killed. Therefore, there's people who don't want to, uh, they don't want to get into confrontation or into an argument or to lose their lives or their families so on and so forth. They all come and they pledge allegiance. Now on Wednesday 30th of Safar, they sit down and they ask who hasn't come to pledge allegiance after this invitation of pledging allegiance has taken place, there's still some people who haven't come to pledge allegiance. Say, who hasn't come to pledge allegiance? So you say, well, this, this person, this person, this person has not come. And then they say, nobody from the Bani Hashim has come to pledge allegiance. So they say, well, let's go to, forget all of these other people, they're not very important, come to the area where Bani Hashim live and we have to come, go and get allegiance from them. So, this is now Wednesday 30th of Safar. A group of people led by the second Khalifa <coughs> come towards the house of Fatima Salamullah in order to ask Imam Amirul Mu'mineen to pay allegiance to Abu Bakr. When they come, Fatima Salamullah Aleha refuses to entertain them, refuses to answer them, and says that Imam Amirul Mu'min would not come out. When they face this refusal, then they say, We're going to burn the house down. They gather the wood and they set fire to the wood, and the house does burn down. Fatima Salamullah in order to save her hijab comes between the wall and the door. The nail in the door goes into her ribs, crushes her ribs and as a result of that her baby is miscarried, so on and so forth. Imam Amir al-Mu'min is then taken from the house forcibly, dragged into the masjid and then he's told that he has to play, pledge allegiance. Imam Amir al-Mu'min replies that if I do not, what would happen? They, will say, they say, we will kill you. Imam says, if you kill me, you will have killed a servant of God and the brother of Holy Prophet of Islam. Second Khalifa replies, we consider you a servant of God, but we do not consider you the brother of the Holy Prophet of Islam. One of the narratives states that after the martyrdom of Hazrat Zahra Alaiha, Abu Bakr himself comes and uh, taps his hand on the hand of Imam Amir al-Mu'min and says that this is the, uh, the, the allegiance, this is, this is done. Imam Amir al-Mu'min at no point that willingly offers allegiance, nor is it uh, any Imam والسلام, who offers allegiance to anybody else. However, this is the, what had transpired after the Holy Prophet passed away. 
But all of this gives us an insight into uh, how quickly people forgot, how quickly people became intimidated after the Holy Prophet Islam. And when this was the state with Imam Amirul Mu'min then what about those who followed him and believed in him and accepted him as the Imam? So Imam Amirul Mu'min he uh, goes through these difficulties, he's dragged out of the house in order to be brought into the masjid. And his followers, of course, would have gone through and did go through much more difficult situations. That they're intimidated, forced into silence, not able to speak out or say anything. If they say anything, they're threatened to be killed, threatened to be excommunicated from society and be made a pariah into, in their own society. Amongst the emphasis and the idea that we have within the school of Ahl al-Bayt of the great day of Eid, the greatest day of Eid being the day of Ghadir, uh, it is important to highlight that it's not the day of the appointment as such of Imam Ali as the successor of the Holy Prophet, um, but rather declaration of it. And there is a difference because the study of the seerah, the biography of the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and its holy progeny, reveals a very important fact. And it is a fact because it's agreed by Muslims, Sunni and Shia, from day one, the Prophet of Islam, in numerous occasions, would inform the Muslims that after me, it's Ali ibn Abi Talib. After me, it's Ali ibn Abi Talib. Take, for example, when Allah says to him, inform and declare the message to your uh, tribe, to your, uh, the members, the leading members of Quraysh. And he invites them in the house of Abu Talib alayhi salam. And he says to them, you know, uh, I've come to you with the message of salvation, that there is no Lord except Allah and I am the messenger. Who amongst you believes in me and, you know, follows me and so that he becomes my vicegerent, my brother, my successor after me. Nobody responds except on three occasions, Imam Ali alayhi salam. Then he would say, Ali is akhi wa waziri wa khalifati min ba'di. And then they would mock, they would say to Abu Talib, look, he has placed your son as what? As our head. Yes. This is evidence in being presented. Similarly, when it comes to the Prophet of Islam leaving Medina and the Amir Imam Ali alayhi salam staying in Medina for the uh, Battle of Tabuk, and when the Prophet in a hadith which is mutawatir, established, authentic, known as hadith al-manzila, anta minni bi manzilati Haruna min Musa, you are to me what, like what Aaron was to Moses, except that there is no Prophet after me, which was mentioned in numerous occasions. Um, we have these incidents throughout the lives of the Holy, life of the Holy Prophet, all throughout maybe possibly over 20 years, that was continuously emphasized for Muslims to recognize and not to be surprised on the day of Ghadir, not to be somehow, where did this come from? That's why it is, we don't have evidence that you know people came to the Prophet on the day when they, Ghadir, and they heard this, they came to the Prophet and said, that's very surprising, large number, except a very small isolated people whom Allah punished. But the majority, vast, vast majority, uh, including some well-known companions, came and gave their allegiance and bay'ah and went to that particular tent and recognized that it was something that's not new, but it was made in a special occasion after the pilgrimage of Hajj, highlighting importance. And of course, the Prophet of Islam would leave the, the world, uh, you know, shortly after that, within, within, a, within uh, two months or so, uh, a bit more than two months. So they find that that was more of an emphasis rather than a new announcement for people. But it was of course linked to the Quranic verses which highlighted that it must have been done, must be declared. And indeed, what it highlights to us as well is when Allah says to the Messenger, He says, if you don't do so, that means the Prophet had a choice. If he didn't have a choice, the Quran would not say to the Prophet, if you don't do so. Uh, it would be a waste to say that if the Prophet was somehow compelled to make this particular declaration. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to them, if you don't do so in your entire 23 years, all that you have done is nullified, is zeroed, is annihilated. And this is how it's so important that this is 
held, celebrated, discussed intellectually with evidence and presented so that people are able to understand the beauty, the magnificence, the special day known as the day of Ghadir, the day of Wilaya, the day of God's selection of Imam Ali salam on earth as his vicegerent and his representative. If you were to ask me what is the, uh, the, the most important part of the sermon or what is the important context of the sermon it's quite straightforward and simple that you can see from the sermon that you must understand, acknowledge and accept the authority and power Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has over you you have to then accept, acknowledge the power and authority that Rasulullah has over you and that combined that divinely power and authority that Rasulullah has over you has now been transferred to Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. So, whatever authority and power Rasulullah had over the Ummah now belongs to Ali ibn Abi Talib. And for you to disregard that, or for you to not acknowledge that, or for you to turn your heels, is like turning your heels against the Prophet. It's like turning your back and your heels against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala You might as well just spit at the authority that's in front of you And it is total disrespect And having total um, disregard for the religion of Islam And for the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala When we look at the wealth of narrations that exist That is agreed upon by all Muslim Sunni and Shia we come to the conclusion that the day of Ghadir should be a day of celebration, reflection, uh, intellectual study and understanding by all Muslims. It is not a day that should be limited to a group of people only or within the school of Ahl al-Bayt. It is an uh, important day to bring the Muslims together under the beautiful banner of Wilaya and the love and the respect of the Ahl al-Bayt. All Muslims uh, celebrate and follow or claim to love the Ahl al-Bayt. When it comes to a day like a day of Ghadir, irrespective of people's understanding of what actually Ghadir means or what actually happened on the 18th of the Hijjah, they should come together and perhaps study and analyze and celebrate the great personalities of this day, the Holy Prophet and Imam Ali, peace and blessings be upon them. Yes, There is no doubt that it's to do with these two holy individuals. If there is a uh, disagreement as to what it actually means theologically, then that can be discussed. But at least let's look at the greatness of these two holy individuals and what does that mean for us and learn from them. So it's the day that should bring people together and there is no harm in ensuring that uh, one is able to present and learn from the other and have an open mind in discussions. The Quranic message is such, that of reflection, that of contemplation and pondering. The Quranic message is قُلْ تَعَالَوْ Say, come, let's discuss in a calm manner, unemotional, let's present the evidence and it's up to the person to accept or not, but they should be able to willing to look at the evidence that is presented before them and make their own conclusions through dedicated, unbiased research. Assalamu alaikum ya amin Allah. Assalamu